Uh, a first couple of order of business, we've got a full schedule lined up for this year, uh, for this um, end of season. So you can take a look at the links provided on Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, LinkedIn, our AAPG website, and uh, uh, I may be forgetting somewhere else. And uh, before we continue with a uh, message uh, with, with the webinar, including Chris, I'd like to introduce one of our newest members to the, uh, the technical interest group committee co-leads, Connor O'Sullivan. Connor, welcome. Hi all, thanks guys. Look forward to uh, helping out and being a part of this great community. No, we're, we're really looking forward to having you and uh, getting some more uh, elbow grease in from you and your expertise. Let's do it. Now, uh, uh, anyone else wanna say anything before we continue? Okay. Uh, no, yeah. We're looking at a great uh, season. So without further ado, we'll get it started. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A function or the chat, but the Q&A is easier for us. And if, uh, if, if at the end we want to have a voice question, uh, we can handle those too, but you have to let us know that you want to ask your question in voice. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Chris Jackson, uh, very famous. He's been the BBC for Christmas <laughs> lecturer very recently. So I'm sure many, many of you have seen him before. Chris is uh, a, an Equinor Professor of Base Analysis at Imperial College of London. I'm not sure if that's, can, is that out of date, Chris? No, four and a half weeks left to go. I'm not counting okay. or anything, but yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, having completed his BSc, his bachelor's in 1998 and a PhD in 2002 at the University of Manchester. Chris was employed as an exploration research geologist in the Norse Hydro, now Equinor, uh, Research Center in Bergen, Norway. Since moving to Imperial College in 2004, Chris's research has focused on using traditional fieldwork techniques and seismic reflection data to study the tectonic stratigraphic analysis of sedimentary basins. So without further ado, Chris, would you like to take it off? Yes, thank you so much everybody for joining me today and us today. And uh, uh, hopefully you can all see me. Uh, well, you can all see the screen at least, you might be able to see me. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a huge honor and privilege to get to talk about salt tectonics and just to talk about science that excites me in general. Um, it's also really exciting to be able to talk about the work that you've done with others. And as you can see from my title slide here, I've been fortunate enough over the last few years to work with some excellent um, experienced and some early career scientists as well who were all named on this slide here. So I'm going to kind of name check them as we go through the talk so that, you know, they get the, the appropriate level of recognition for their work. As you can see here on the acknowledgement slide, there's also a range of data providers, companies who provided either data or and uh, funding towards this research. And we're greatly uh, appreciative of, of their uh, support. <clears throat> so today, um, we're talking about ramp incline basins. They're probably my favorite type of salt tectonic thing at the moment. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the genesis, kinematics and imports. And I'm aware that Sean Evans talked a bit about this in uh, the first half of season one. So I will um, be fairly brief in aspects of this presentation, but I will also call back to some of Sean's work towards the end of the, of the talk. So when we think about the seismic stratigraphic architecture of mini basins, we have in our heads these different types of geometries. In the top left in here, we have a mini basin bound by two um, inflating salt diapirs. And in that mini basin, we have a series of bowl shaped uh, depositional packages, which are documenting the subvertical subsidence of that sediment into salt. In the top right in here, we may have a sedimentary body like a delta building out from the basin margin. And as that progrades onto and loads and expels the salt, we have a series of wedges uh, deposited, which thicken and then thin in the direction of progradation. If we have a situation where we have a mini basin subsiding into salt, but we also have a coeval shortening, horizontal shortening, we can have differential inflation of the bounding diapirs, and that can cause the mini basin to wobble. And as it wobbles, 
we go from a series of bowl shaped um, depositional packages which may become thrusted into these uh, more wedge shaped packages which are documenting the differential tilt in the mini base and the differential flux of salt into the rising diapirs. They're kind of odd, but things get odder when you really start to look in detail at um, some mini basins or some super salt depot centers in certain parts of the world. And this is an example from some of Leo uh, Pichel's work from the Santos Basin, where I actually saw these things back in 2009 when I was working on the intrasalt stuff and I ignored them. So it took me about 17 years to actually work out what they were. But I saw these rather odd landward dipping packages within the overburden in the Santos Basin. This is on the Sao Paulo Plateau. If I just show you the interpretation here, here's the salt basin top. We have an Albion broadly isopacus layer in here with the white horizon at its top. And then we have these colored horizons defining these um, growth packages within this rather weird looking depot center. Because if you notice above this top unconformity, things get kind of flat and well behaved again. Now, I never really knew what they were. I ignored them and I also didn't really pay much mind to what's going on beneath the salt because this was a time migrated data set so I kind of just assumed a lot of what we were seeing below the salt were uh, velocity related pull-ups and I didn't really know much about base salt relief either so um, we do when we look at super salt deficits in more detail see some rather more exotic geometries and these you cannot relate in an easy way of progradation from the Atlantic Ocean back towards Brazil. So these are dipping in the wrong direction for that sort of interpretation. So how might these sorts of uh, geometries form? Well, I'm showing you here a really nice um, physical model from uh, Sean Evans. And I think Sean showed this talk, but I wanted to show it again. So what you're looking at here is um, base salt, uh, subsalt is in dark in here. And this is in a CT scanner. So what you're seeing in this deeper orange color is salt. And what you're seeing being added in here are these lighter overburden units. And what you can easily see is the flux of salt in this open toed system to the right, seaward or down dip. We can see that pre-kinematic layer is being bent over these steps and we're getting extensional faults. You see there, we just jacked the model up to steepen it to increase the rate of translation. What I really want to draw your attention to in here, oops, um, sorry. What I want to draw your attention to in here are these depot centers which are forming just basinward of these seaward dipping base salt steps. You can see these asymmetric packages of stratigraphy that are thickening, dipping and onlapping landward onto that broadly pre-kinematic initial layer. These are these ramp syncline basins and you can see straight away a geometric similarity with what you saw in the seismic profile on the slide uh, previously. What you're also seeing forming um, at the same time as everything's translating down dip are two key things. One is a series of normal faults which are forming, which are documenting extension of the overburden, and they're actually disrupting the ramp syncline basins, they're chopping them up. And as a function of reactive diaperism, because of that overburden extension, we're actually got reactive diaperic rise. So we have horizontal translation, but also stretching as well as diaperic rise. So we have a number of different processes going on. What's really important is you can see the onlap horizon where my, um, where my cursor is in here. If we measure from that distance there back to the top of the step, that gives us the magnitude or the distance of horizontal translation. So that's a really useful thing um, in some of the geometric and kinematic analysis we're gonna show you later. All of this relates to the fact that fluxes, the, the flux of salt across the, um, well, the initial salt thickness and then the variable flux of salt across base salt relief is variable. So we can have low amounts of flux of salt here where we have thin salt above this base um, high block, base salt high block. And then as we increase the flux of salt across here, as the salt thickens, we can get extension at the top of the step. And as that salt hits this slower moving, thicker salt down dip at the base of the step, we can have this contractional hinge. And then we have high flux of the system pulling away here and we can have extension again. So we can get superimposed extensional and contractional domains in a kind of mid slope position. And that's what you're seeing here at the top uh, in, the, in the model. 
So why are ramps, incline basins important? And why bother giving this talk and doing this work? Well, if we think about it, if we have a situation here where we have a uh, pre-salt rift sequence containing source rocks, and then we have a salt labeled is in blue in here, and here's the ramp incline basin above the salt. These reservoirs, which were initially deposited up here, have now been translated several tens of kilometers down dip. So they may have been initially sitting above uh, immature source rock in the shallower part of the rift to now be sitting above deeper buried, more mature or mature source rock in here and they could be charged. So th there is, a, there is a, a dynamism, if you will, to the reservoirs after they've been, um, they've actually been uh, deposited as a function of this translation. The other thing that's really useful for these ramps incline basins is when we see them that they often may indicate that there is a subsalt high. So if we have poor subsalt seismic imaging, we can look at these geometries in the overburden to try and understand where and how big these base salt steps might be, such as the one I'm sketching out here, and how they may relate to the ramp incline basins. So they may be useful in that respect. Ramp incline basins may also be useful for structural restoration. As I said, we often see these in this translational domain where normally we'd have relatively limited quantitative information if we were doing a structural restoration, if we simply had vertical salt tectonics documented here in the form of diapers, passive diapers and, and down building mini basins. But if we have base salt relief in this location, we may actually get some information in these ramps incline basins about how far the overburden has traveled and the salt structures themselves. It's easier in the upslope domain because we can just look at extensional uh, normal fault heaves and down dip in the lower slope. We could look at um, thrust fault contractional heaves and, and, and try and use those to, to inform our restoration. So what else would we like to know about ramps incline basins? So can we use them to constrain rates of deformation? Because that's one thing that we um, often lack, I think, still is, is rates of deformation in salt tectonics. Um, how does ramps incline basin development interact with these other processes? So like diaprism and faulting, we saw that really nicely in Sean's physical model, but what about in these natural systems? How does ramps incline basin development relate to base salt relief? So the magnitude of base salt relief and the, and the, and the trend, if you will, and also salt thickness variability, because we do live in a three-dimensional world. Everything I've shown you so far has been two-dimensional. And how diachronous are ramps incline basins in terms of when they start and when they end, and over what length and actual temporal scales does that diachronity occur? I'm going to look at examples from offshore Brazil, Angola, and the Eastern Mediterranean uh, uh, as well. And, and I'll also show actually one example from Morocco. This map on the right is showing you kind of is from some of the original work by Mike Hudek and uh, Martin Jackson. And I just show this to show you that even when they did that very kind of sophisticated um, analysis of ramps incline basins on that margin, they did indicate that at base salt level, which is the there was lots of base salt relief. So you can see these gray shaded areas and the black arrows are showing you the dip direction of the base salt relief. So imagine you're translating across something which is as spatially complex as this. And also imagine that offshore Angola, there are a long strike changes in primary salt thickness as well, which will also control the, the rate and, and patterns of deformation. So I'm first gonna take you to the Santos Basin offshore Brazil. Um, this is going to be some work where, for, including, uh, which was led by Leo Pichal. This is me and Leo having a good time on a mountain in Bergen a few weeks ago. This is Frank Peel who was involved in Massusa as well at Manchester. So this is the Sao Paulo Plateau in here. We've got base of salt I'm tracing out here and the salt is in pink. And the 3D seismic data and the well data we had sat right above the crest of the Sao Paulo Plateau. Um, here we have layered actin evaporites, which had an initial salt thickness of up to two and a half kilometers, obviously pinching out to zero towards the basin margin. But in the area we're studying, probably were as little as one kilometer thick at times or during the primary salt thickness. We have base salt relief as shown here due to an earlier rift event. And then we have this 3D seismic and borehole data. So this is our base salt structure map in here. Red is shallow and blue is deep, sorry for the color bar. Uh, and this is based on time migrated data, but we did a crude depth conversion to actually correct this to, um, to, to, to check that we were actually seeing uh, base salt highs. And you can see these base salt highs in here. These are 
these are fault blocks related to the pre-Aptian um, pre rift uh, in through here. We quality controlled our time migrated depth converted base salt map by looking at maps generated from true depth migrated data. This is some work from Tiago Alves and co-workers in here. And I've just kind of put it exactly the same scale here. So you're seeing the 2P high in here where, um, which is shown in here on our map. And you can see a good correspondence in the geometries between the two maps, which gave confidence that our depth migration of our time migrated data was actually giving us a, a good handle on what the true base salt relief was. This is the top salt map in here. I never tire of showing this map because it's absolutely beautiful. We've got this very complex polygonal array of salt, um, salt uh, diapirs separated by these mini basins. Uh, and just for scale, that's 50 kilometers near. So this is a big piece of real estate. And now I've animated on here the ramp syncline basins. Um, so there's, a, there's actually a couple more than this, but there's five main ones in here. And I'm gonna show you images from, from three of these now. So you can see some of them are basin would have this big 2P high one and four. Uh, ramp syncline basin number five is sort of just down, well, up dip of 2P and two and three are also up dip of the, the kind of the sugar loaf high in here. So let's start off with ramp syncline basin one. Uh, there's a little location map in the top right for you with a right red line showing the location. This is the uh, seismic uninterpreted on the left hand side. If I put on the interpretation here, you can see the salt in blue, this beautifully layered um, heterogeneous Aptian salt. We have that Isopacus or broadly Isopacus Albion layer here capped by the white event. And then we have that ramp syncline basin on top with these landward dipping, thickening and onlapping wedges. And you can see that these are onlapping directly onto the top of the Albion, indicating that the Albion, um, the end of the Albion defines the onset of translation. This ramp syncline basin, as you can see sketched in here, is the, this is the base um, salt relief um, sketched in here. And you can see that these are related to translation of the salt and the overburden over a fairly major, several hundreds of meter tall um, base salt ramp. So in this case, we measure the onlap point from around about here, the first onlap point in the ramp syncline basin back to the top of the ramp. And that gives us a minimum horizontal translation distance of around about five kilometers. As I said just then, the onlap is onto the top Albion surface, indicating the translation started then around about 100 million years ago. And we can also see that the ramp syncline basin is deformed both by salt cord folds and also by extensional normal faults. Cast your mind back to Sean's model earlier on, which showed the progressive evolution of folds and faults as a function of translation of everything across the base salt relief. Let's take you further towards the southwest, towards Ramp Syncline Basin 2. This is the uninterpreted profile. Here's the interpretation, salt is in blue. And we see this really beautiful, broad Ramp Syncline Basin in here with these intra um, Ramp Syncline Basin growth packages defined by these colored reflection, uh, colored horizons mapped in here. If we map from the earliest onlaps in here, it's actually kind of around about here, back to this this, um, this um, base salt ramp, ramp in here, which actually when you depth convert it, is actually a seaward dipping, is actually a landward dipping ramp, sorry, of a few hundred meters. So this is one of the cases where when you take this thick salt and push the base salt down because the velocities in here are higher than the mini basin, things actually dip the other way. This is actually a, a, a landward facing ramp and we still get ramp syncline basins above those as well. And this gives us 18 kilometers or so of horizontal translation. So more than we saw in the example in Ramp Syncline Basin 1 towards the northeast. What I also want to draw your attention to here is um, the fact that here, these horizons, this onlap is onto this white horizon, but this white horizon is not top Albion here. Top Albion is slightly deeper, it's here. I'm tracing out. So the onlap surface, the Ramp Syncline Basin here is quite a bit younger than the one we saw in Ramp Syncline Basin 1 suggesting that the translation started later. So there is some diachronity already in the onset of translation, also variability in the magnitude of translation. And again, the ramp syncline basin here is, is flanked by diapirs and partly dissected by normal faults. 
And now let's scoot back towards the east in front of the 2P high here again. Here's that um, location map for you. So we're south of where we were with Ramp Syncline Basin 1. Here's the uninterpreted seismic profile. Here's the interpreted profile. Salt is in blue. There's the reconstructed base salt relief shown here at the bottom in this black line. So we've got two major seaward dipping base salt ramps of several hundreds of meters relief. If we go up in here, we see that the white horizon here is capping truly the base top of the Albion. So we can see that broadly Isopacus Albion layer in here, and that's defining the onlap surface of this nice ramp syncline basin here, which is itself folded. However, what you can see is that the red horizon, which is the unconformity at the top of the lower ramp syncline basin, is itself onlapped by another set of growth strata related to an upper ramp syncline basin. So here we've actually got two stacked ramp syncline basins, which is probably no surprise given that we actually have two base salt ramps. So we think that the upper ramp syncline basin in here formed above the more southeasterly ramp in here. And the lower ramp syncline basin here actually formed due to translation across the more up dip um, um, uh, base salt ramp in here. So it was translated across here and then was translated across the more seaward phase, seaward um, located ramp and was itself onlapped. However, we do this restoration, when we bring this back to this point here, we get about 14 kilometers of horizontal translation as defined by that lower ramp syncline basin. Here, it seems to be the onset of translation seems to be consistent with ramp syncline basin one, that's just a long strike to the north. Uh, so it started around about hundred million years ago. And these ramp syncline basins have really, really been deformed. So you can see that they're folded. There's actually some kind of salt anticlines underneath. They're, they're deformed by these nice salt cord buckle folds as well. So these ramp syncline basins undergo quite a bumpy journey after they form as a function of the kinematic regime they subsequently find themselves in as a function of the base salt relief they subsequently find themselves traveling over. And we think these ramp stacks, ramp syncline basins can be um, kind of interpreted in this way. This is base salt. This is a simple model, geometric model by Frank Peel. Salt is in blue. But you can see that this up dip ramp syncline basin, if we play the movie again, you can see there's one forming at the up dip ramp. There's one forming at the down dip ramp in here. Both of them are seaward dipping. And you can see that there's an onlap surface here at the down dip margin of the lower ramp syncline basin by, the, and that's been on by that upper ramp syncline basin. So not a perfect match, but we do think it records the subsequent deformation, subsequent translation deformation of earlier formed basins. So um, we can look at these three dimensionally. We've been still kind of very much hooked into a two dimensional world in those first few images here, but we can obviously go away and map discrete packages within these ramp syncline basins and make thickness maps to see how the earlier formed epicenters translate. So Leo did this in a paper he published a couple of years ago. This is the earliest ramp syncline basin growth strata wedge we were able to map in here. This is the next one. That's the next youngest and the next youngest. And you can see what we're drawing in here are black closing contours to show the depicenter um, locus, the center of the depicenters. Another one, another one. So we can actually stack these all the way back to this position. So this actually defines the the tra sorry, the trajectory uh, of travel of the ramp syncline basins through time and therefore of the salt. And we see overall translation towards around uh, 120, towards the east, southeast or southeast in through here. And that's consistent with the overall base salt um, dip in the Sao Paulo plateau. We also notice that the depicenters get more rounded through time. So we go from these margin parallel or transport direction normal depicenters, these rather elongate ones in the early stage, these more rounded ones in the later stage. And we think that's because at the same time as things are translating and we're actually getting some stretching of the bird and we actually have some diapirs rising as well. So that kind of confines the, 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 the depicenters and changes them from elongate to rounded. I don't want to kind of dwell on this too much because I think there's going to be a separate talk about this at some point later this year. If not, you've probably heard Leo talk a lot about this, is how we use these ramp syncline basins and regional kinematic analysis 
All I want to say here is in the Sao Paulo Plateau, uh, in the Santos Basin, there is a, a discussion around this thing called the Albion Gap, um, where there's an absence of Albion strata and there's an absence or very thin salt and whether that's an extensional structure or an expulsion structure. What's important here is that the ramp syncline basins here on the Sao Paulo Plateau in this area here, define 30 kilometers of translation, suggesting that indeed there is 30 kilometers of true extension captured up here with the additional 30, 30 kilometers being um, uh, characterized by um, or being driven by expulsion. So a kind of mix and match of, of, of styles of, 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 of processes have led to the formation of the Albion Gap, which is different to what I said in the paper in 2015, but I'm always happy to be proved wrong. Ultimately, I should have looked down dip before I Locked up dip is the is the moral of that story. So just to summarise the first bit of the talk there, and um, we see that these ramp incline basins form above basalt ramps which can dip landward or seaward. Um, in the Sao Paulo plateau, everything was moving broadly towards the southeast. Uh, we have maximum translation magnitudes of around about thirty two kilometres at a rate of about up to about one kilometre per million years. I'm going to come back to the rates and magnitudes at the end of the talk. Translation started in the early Albion to Middle Cretaceous, but I did show you there was some diachronity in the timing of the onset and, and everything ended by about the Middle Paleocene. And we see that this synchronous contraction extension, these different deformation styles in the overburden, because the base salt relief is three-dimensionally quite complex, so moving from a 2D world to a 3D world. And diachronism is important as well, and I showed you that um, by how it cause those depicts to become less elongate and more circular. So let's step across the ocean to the outer Kwanzaa Basin and look at some work which was done um, by some, I'll, I'll come on to that, some work that was done in that basin there. This is a cross section just to set it up, African margin over here towards the, um, uh, towards the east, thick salt uh, out towards the west, towards the Atlantic. And you can see straight away as I'm tracing out here, there is considerable base salt relief, again, related to the rift, which was associated with the breakup of the South Atlantic and salt of various thickness. Here's a kind of uh, seismic profile from the 3D volume that we had access to. Um, base, the subsalt is in gray, salt is in pink, and we can straight away see uh, three beautiful ramp incline basins in the overburden labeled one, two, and, and three. And this is work which was done by a very excitable Sean Evans, as you can see here. And then Oreo, if you look really closely, you can see him in the background smiling um, as they were both working on different aspects of these data. And there's Oreo in a, in a more serious moment. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight some of the work that Sean and Oreo did around ramp syncline basins. So here's a base salt map. So it's at this level and through here. Um, Shallow is red and, and purple is deep towards the bottom left. And we can see straight away, there's some closely spaced contours at base salt level. So that's actually that base salt ramp you can see in the cross section there. And then outboard of that major base salt ramp, you can see these more isolated highs. So there's a little bump at base salt here. This is a depth migrated volume, by the way. So we can see these isolated base salt highs. So the dominant base salt dip is towards the southwest, but we do have superimposed on that a few lumps and bumps. If we look at top salt, so this is this level in here, we have some really nice salt walls in here, a couple of small salt stops as well, and then these, these purple areas defining these mini basins, where as you can see in the cross section, we have primary welds formed where Albion carbonate bearing strata are touched down on the subsalt strata. So there's a, this whole kind of assemblage of, of salt um, wall um, trends in here. And, and Sean talked uh, quite a lot about that in her paper in 2019. So let's focus now on the ramp syncline basins uh, rather than the salt structures themselves. So we're gonna look at isopacks now for ramp syncline basin one, two, and three to look at Thickness patterns in there, but also what they tell us about the kinematics. So we're gonna look at the present day distribution and geometry of those before then reconstructing the kinematics or attempting to reconstruct the kinematics. So this is ramp syncline basin one. This is the isopack down in here. Uh, thick is purple, red is, is thin. And we can see there's ramp syncline basin one, north trending about five kilometers wide and about 25 kilometers long. 
And remember, that's actually quite oblique to that northwest southeast striking uh, base salt ramp here. So this is sitting at quite an angle to that. If we look at ramps incline basin too, so this is an isochron of this ramps incline basin and through here, this is it through here. It's almost 50 kilometers long, similar width to ramps incline basin one, and it's slightly less oblique to that base salt ramp. And I'll come back and show you another image of that in a moment. And then finally, the youngest ramps incline basin, which is ramps incline basin three, which is still active today, has a much more kind of north northwest uh, trend to it and is very, very long as well. So the most recent one is, is quite elongate, whereas this younger one seems, at least in the data we have here, slightly more, less elongate. So we can see that change in the obliquity of the ramps incline basins. And so what, what, how, do we, how do we then interpret that? What does that tell us? If we think that these ramps incline basins in here formed as a function of translation of salt and overburden over this major um, kind of one and a half kilometer high base salt uh, ramp. Well, in this diagram in here in pink are the present day position of the salt walls. The black lines in here, which I'm tracing out are just defining that major base salt ramp. And the red, like the red kind of outline in here, this one I'm circling, is the heart of the ramps incline basin. One, as we see it present day, so the oldest one. So we think you can rotate that to restore it back to having formed at this base salt step and having undergone about 32 degrees of rotation in a clockwise direction. So it's translated about 23 kilometers and it's rotated around 32 degrees. We then can look at ramps incline basin two in here. Again, we restore that back to what we think is the causal ramp that yields a translation magnitude of around about 11 kilometers and a rotation of 12 degrees. So it's undergone less translation, which makes sense. And it's rotated less than the older ramps incline basin, which again makes sense. And then we look at the most recent ramps incline basin and through here, we can rotate that back to what we think is the causal ramp and we get a translation magnitude of just above five kilometers and a rotation of around about five degrees. Um, so we can see that these ramps incline basins are, are formed as the salt and its overburden have flowed seaward towards the southwest across that major ramp. So Aurea used um, in a more recent paper building on some of Sean's work, he used those ramps and incline basins to help inform his regional kinematic analysis in a similar way to what Leo has done in a few in a couple of previous pieces of work. So he used that to help uh, generate this, this restoration um, <clears throat> back through time, which actually allowed us to have a few pinpoints um, when we're trying to position these various complex salt structures and the overburden structures. So I'm not going to go into that in this talk, but just to say that the ramps incline basins are really important to help us move everything back um, landward. And, and Oreo also used that building on some of Sean's work to um, look at um, translation magnitudes and rotation amounts through time along the margin. So what I want you to concentrate on here is the x-axis is in time, going back to some time in the Albion, and the translation magnitude is on the y-axis from zero to, to 35 in here. So what you can see in here, the brown line in here is a restoration he did in the south. And you can see that the onset of translation was earlier than it was in the north, which is this bright green line. So it happened, it started about 10 million years later in the north. But then once everything started flowing seaward, we can see the rates, for the brown line, the green line and the bright green line are all similar. The gradients are the same, so the rates are similar. But then we had variable acceleration of um, translation presumably due to a long strike variations in both the timing of uplift of the African margin, but also perhaps changes in, a long strike changes in the thickness of the primary salt, which meant that the system reacted differently to that, that base salt tilting driven by continental uplift, as we see in here. So just to summarize before I get into the last few slides of the talk for the Angola examples, again, we see these ramps incline basins forming um, above the landward dipping base salt ramps. Here we see slightly less horizontal translation of around about 23 kilometers, but the rate was, and the rate was less, it's about 0.23 kilometers per million years, but we do see substantial rotations of the oldest ramps incline basins. 
Translation commenced the Albion, which is probably not a surprise given it's the twin of the uh, Brazilian margin, so similar geologies and, and similar timings. And again, we see diaperism being really important. I'm going to look at some other examples now. I'm just going to close the door because my kids have come back from school. One second. There we go, I'm back. Um, so we're going to look at some other examples. So what I want to do now is start to compile some data, some quantitative information about things like translation rates, translation magnitudes, primary salt thickness, and then you know, because I think this is somewhere where it's going to be interesting to go with some of the work we've been doing on ramp incline basis is trying to become more quantitative and looking at a more comparative study beyond these case studies I've presented. So let's start off by going to offshore Morocco to so some of Leo's PhD work. Um, here we can see some ramp incline basins which are forming above allochthonous salt. Everything else I've shown has been above autochthonous salt. But here's the allochthonous salt in the canopy. And we can see a really nice um, ramp incline basin in here above this, um, this seaward dipping ramp in through here with this really nice inclined axial trace. And then another ramp incline basin here down dip of a salt anticline above a landward facing base salt ramp. So you can see there's a couple of um, anticlines um, in here, but also um, these ramp incline basins. So in terms of the ages, sorry, just to go back, the ages here are not brilliantly constrained, but these ramp incline basins are, are, are thought to be Cenozoic. So the, um, the calculations here are that the primary salt thickness in the canopy was around about a kilometer. The ramp incline basin ages are Cenozoic. The translation magnitudes are less than we saw in Brazil for the most part, eight to 10 kilometers, and the translation rates are quite low. So 0.2 uh, kilometers per million years. So some of the lowest we've yet seen. Let's go to the Campos Basin. So let's step back across the ocean and look at some of Francine uh, Bocci's work. Uh, here's Francine looking very cool. Whilst looking at this, these kind of these these are the things we're working on at the moment. They're quite unusual ramp incline basins. You can see that kind of we've got these odd wedge-shaped geometries in here that thin and thickened. They're partly dissected by these salt-detached normal faults, and they're above very thin salt in the very proximal domain of Campos. So we're doing some work at the moment to try and understand how these work when we have the superimposed kinematics of translation and extension. Francie's doing a lot of work to map these out. This is a more regional zoom in of one of these isolated structures I've just shown you in here. You can see the down dip um, mini basins and diapers and what eventually becomes the contractional domain. But we can see this rollover system in here is at least partly, con con is at least partly composed of, um, of ramp incline basins. She's done a lot of mapping in here. So this is a big map. This is 50 kilometers. It's an impressive piece of mapping. So Francine's there. It's, it's really remarkable what she's put together. Um, and what you've got sketched in here are these ramps incline basins, which we only see in the northeast of her study area, not in the southwest. So we're currently trying to work out why we have well-developed ramps incline basins in here and not over here. And maybe it's because we go from an area of horizontal translation in here accommodated by just bulk translation to extension and translation, which is more accommodated by brittle normal faults, albeit salt detached normal faults down in the Southwest. Here we have that primary salt thickness in this proximal domain and campus of probably a few hundred meters to a kilometer, similar ages to what we saw into the Santos and Albion to Palagene. Translation magnitudes are really high, 30 to 50 kilometers. We're arguing about that amongst ourselves. There's different proposals depending on what you use, whether you use ramps incline basins or buckle folds to, to, to what translation magnitude you calculate. But the translation rate comes down to about 0.3 to 0.5 kilometers per million years. So again, slightly at the lower end of things. So finally, or one of the last examples is from the Levantine margin. This is Davida Oppo looking very cool. He looks like a total rock star in this picture. And he's looking very lovingly at these rather exquisite ram incline basins that Sean has been working on with myself and Davida. And Sean talked about this in one of the earlier seminars. So I don't really want to go into a lot of detail about this, apart from to say she did a lot of detailed mapping of growth wedges in here. And in this case, the ramp incline basins related to basal anticlines. 
Sean mapped these ramps, incline basins along a huge strike length of the margin and looked at how, um, as she showed in her talk, the, the movement of these things was, was rather pulsed and quite complicated and how that might speak to um, the kind of rather complex kinematics going on in the Sultan and, it, and, and its overburden. All I want to pull out of Sean's work, rather than representing any of it, because she did an amazing job of that already, is to say, okay, here we had relatively thick salt of a couple of kilometers. These ramps incline basins are really young, Pliocene to recent in contrast to the other examples we looked at earlier. The translation magnitudes are not that much. I've kind of mis left that in there by accident, but here the translation magnitudes are um, a, a few kilometers. So if I just step back in here, they're probably around about five, six, seven kilometers translation. And here we have really rapid rates of translation, relatively rapid rates of translation of two to 2.7 kilometers per million years. So just the final example before my final slide comes to the Northern Gulf of Mexico from some work by Nayara Fernandez, um, looking at ramps incline basins, again, above a lot of an assault here. So above the canopy. So here you can see some a lot of an assault in red. The ramp incline basin is shown here by these downlap arrows onto this pre-ramp wedge. And there's a number of dated horizons within the growth strata. I'll be honest here, the, the oldest horizon that's dated in here is this dashed line in here, which is 4.36 million years ago in the Pliocene. We don't have an age for this deeper horizon when the translation started. So we have to sort of like estimate what we think is some of the oldest strata within that ramp incline basin if we want to calculate a rate. But if we do that, and we think it's round about 7 million years ago, um, we say the primary salt thickness in here was a couple of kilometers thick, it might be too thick, but based on what we can see in the data around here, it might be appropriate. Translation timing is Pliocene to recent, so relatively young. We see translation magnitudes, which are extreme here, 40 kilometers in only less than 10 million years, let's say. And that gives us very fast rates of almost six kilometers per million years. So we have these very rapid translation rates in, um, in this Northern Gulf of Mexico case. So where does that leave us then? So just to go back to the title of my talk, I said I'd talk about the genesis and geometry of ramp incline basins. So these are some generic outcomes. You know, we, we know that they formed due to the horizontal translation of salt and overburden across this complex base salt relief was we're seeing here in Sean's model at the bottom. And that mechanical or kinematically at least is related to how salt fluxes across this relief. So how thick and thin the salt is and how that salt is being loaded by overburdened materials. In terms of their geometry, they're broadly synclinal and margin parallel. Although I did show you that those ramp syncline basins can become more circular if coeval diaporism is occurring. And they're filled by these landward thickening, dipping and onlapping wedges of growth strata as you're seeing in the model down here. In terms of their kinematics, they're dominated by horizontal translation, but there is a lot of diaperism and faulting and thrusting, so normal faulting and thrusting going on due to these flux variations. We also saw from um, Oreo's work and from Sean's work offshore Angola that we can have large amounts of rotations and Leo actually documented this in a few really quite complicated examples on the Sao Paulo plateau um, and these rotations can be over several tens of kilometers but we also see much shorter length scale variations in rotations again because some of these basalt highs are relatively short so you actually can get quite strong twists at the end and some of Tim Dooley's uh, physical animal models really beautifully show those rotations of ramps incline basins, but also salt structures themselves. In terms of the importance, um, they may reveal aspects of the salt basin history. So in Angola, we think that that strong rotation was because the primary salt thickness was greater towards the south uh, east of the margin. So the ramps incline basins were moving faster, or the salt and its overburden was moving faster and therefore imparted a shear, a diffuse shear on the overburden. I hopefully showed you how they can be a valuable restoration tool in the mid slope domain, so we can use these on laps to kind of pin at different time periods where the, where the overburden was and where the salt structures were. And they can be responsible for the seaward or basement translation of super salt reservoirs. So just to return, just, you know, so keep an eye out for them, right? So they are there 
And when you see these unusual geometries, um, have some confidence in what you're interpreting and, and how you may then utilize those geometries. So just to return to that compilation of dates and rates, which I showed in the, when I kind of did a mop up of some of the documented cases, we see that the translation rate can vary by more than an order of magnitude. So less than, well, around 0.2 kilometers per million years to over five, nearer to six kilometers per million years. And, you know, is that, does that, you know, so younger ramp syncline basins seem to be faster than old ones. And is that simply related to the presence of still thick underlying salt? So um, in the Gulf of Mexico example, and certainly in the Levante example, there's still quite a lot of salt underneath. So maybe as we go out to these older ramp syncline basins that were active for longer, we just lose that fast early period in the, in the smear of the long term, right? So then they become very slow and we actually average out to a much slower rate. Maybe it's related to tectonic setting. So in some way, the faster translation is imposed by more rapidly uplifting continental margins or more rapidly uplifting hinterland areas. And that drives this fast flowing, um, fast seaward flow of salt and overburden. So just some things to think about. I wonder if the ultimate limit on the translation rate might be imposed by the salt viscosity. We have some experimentally derived uh, idea of what the viscosity is for salt. So no matter how much you uplift it, it can only shear at a certain rate. And that's, that's, that's ultimately what dictates how fast um, salt can, can flow and also its uh, overburden can translate as well. So just some thoughts from me based on that mop up of some um, nice cases at the end and I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yes, thank you Chris. Um, yeah, it was a very nice presentation seeing uh, this compilation of work um, yeah, for me, for others and I think it shows a, a little bit how much we like those, uh, those structures and, um, and how important I think they can be and how useful. So. Uh, it's good to see the presentation. Thank you again for joining us and, and off presenting to us. Um, we have a few questions, so I'm going to go um, read them uh, to you. If someone wants to ask any question directly, please let me know. Raise your hands in the chat. Um, so the first question is actually from an anonymous attendee. So what is the probability of petroleum in ramps and climb basin? Um, I think it's probably quite high. I mean, some of the, um, in the Santos Basin example, there is no hydrocons as far as I'm aware in the super salt on the Sao, Pla Sao Paulo Plateau and things that we would call ramps incline basins. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be, I guess, hypothetically, is a short answer. Unless there was something specifically the person was asking about. Yes, I think um, that could be perhaps the case in campus basin where you have the super salt uh, turbidites in the proximal. Yeah, intermediate I was going yeah. to say that. I was going to say that, but I thought somebody on the call might tell me that those marlin and all of those marlin are not contained in ramps incline basins. I've never worked there myself, so. Yeah, yeah, perhaps someone else uh, might know it better, but yeah, I, I'm not sure either. Um, but yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. Um, so the next question was actually from Zoltan Unger, but I think, I think he, yeah, he noticed that his, his question was answered already. It was a question about the soft thickness, I think in Santos, uh, it was approximately one second. Um, yeah, I think he, he answered that already. Uh, the next one I think was from Piotr. Uh, so Piotr Krishek, uh, sorry, Piotr, uh, I always struggle to pronounce. <laughs> your name correctly, uh, how this story would change if there was a significant, if there was significant movement on subsoil faults during formation of ramps and climb basins? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's something we actually good, thought yeah. about um, in the Levant, not with subsoil faults, but due to the amplification of the subsoil anticlines. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you could have dynamic base salt relief. So you could start off where you have relatively modest base salt relief and as a function of subsoil extension you actually enhance that relief now it's a great question because i'm trying to think now whether i would expect the translation to be faster than i'd expect the slip rate on the underlying faults because there'll be a buffering effect of the subsalt faults right so you've slipped the faults 
but will you buckle the overburden because you'll absorb some of that strain in the salt? So will it really be expressed straight away, you know, depending on the salt yeah. thickness versus the magnitude of relief at the base of the salt? So again, yeah. theoretically, yes, but yes, theoretically, yes, but I haven't really thought about it. Yeah, I think uh, there was also someone else, uh, uh, I think Maria, uh, Maria Roma, so she kind of asked a similar question. Can we expect additional translation if those subsalt steps will actually be active faults? So if, yeah. yeah, if we have subsalt, normal faulting. And yeah, I mean, we kind of, I think, wonder about that and discuss about that. And this may happen in a few cases. And I think, yeah, um, you'd expect some of the extension to be decoupled from what's going on on the salt and the overburden. But yeah, you'd, I, I imagine you'd expect some acceleration of translation when you have some sort of normal faulting. I suspect, uh, I suspect that, that, that Maria and uh, Peter are asking about, I think it would probably be most enhanced in the most proximal domain. So like in Francine's yeah. area in the campus, where you have salt, which is already quite thin and thinning, if you then reactivate faults in that inboard domain, then you might actually get them causing more base salt relief. Admittedly, the inboard domain is probably joint continental breakup, the last place you'd expect to see reactivated normal faults. You may be expecting to see the faults more seaward. So yeah. 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 Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, the next one is from Mark Rowan. So Chris, we tend to talk about the minimum translation. Um, do you think that Ramsey Klein Basin's record all the translation or some of it is more cryptic? Um, oof, it's a good question, Mark. Um, I'm, I'm looking out at the view and, 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 and considering the question. Um, I guess that if you've got some poroelasticity in the overboard and you can stretch things, you can stretch them bulk without translating them, right? So you could have some stretching before things actually rupture and you get normal faults and then you actually have bulk translation of everything. I don't quite know how much that would contribute um, in terms of, you know, if we've got 32 kilometers, whether that could be a kilometer of stretching that you're missing. Yeah. Um, the, 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 what I would say, Mark, is Francine's work, which I know you're aware of from when she presented at the APG uh, GTW, I think, or the South America G, uh, meeting. Yeah, it was South America. Yeah. The South America one, sorry. That, we do seem to see big ramps incline basins in one part of the data set and not in the other. And it, and it, but in the, in the place where we don't see them, there's lots of salt detached normal faults, which seem to be doing all the work in terms of allowing things to extend, but we just don't see the translation. We don't see the ramps incline basins there, even though there is base salt relief. Because if the base salt relief was missing, right, we, we, we might not expect to see them. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I can comment on that as well. So th this thing of this cryptic, cryptic uh, translation, I'm, there, there must be some, and especially so in, in the Sao Paulo part. So there is definitely some Albion movement that is prior to the ramps incline basin. Um, but during the late Cretaceous and the Paleogene, that's when the ramps incline basin is formed, um, we can actually constrain the maximum translation. And I say maximum in the brackets because they are, there is a margin of error of uh, one or two kilometers over those 30 kilometers wide ramps and climb basins. So there is a little bit of translation that we may not be, it may not be fully constrained by the ramps and climb basin, but that is an order of magnitude lower. So that's not much, right? Um, yeah. And there is some movement in the Albion, even though the Albion in Santos is mostly tabular, right? In, in, that, in that area, actually, in the Sao Paulo Plateau. Yeah. Uh, so there might be some movements. Yeah, I, I believe so in the Albion, especially. But um, so yeah, I, it's hard to say if it, you know, it's uh, Ramsey Klein Basin records all the translation, like uh, capital letters, as he put here, all the translation. There might be some movements that is quick, yeah. but that's much more, much smaller. Um, I don't know if you, if you, if you agree with that, but yeah, that's my my, my idea. Um, yeah. um yeah, um, so the next question, I think is from Juan Soto. Thanks, Chris. How the base, the basin tilting play a role in the kinematics and evolution of the ramps and climb basins? And the rotations you estimated assumed a rigid, rigid body rotation. Um, any comments on this assumption? 
Yeah, so the first part of the question, I guess, is related to the rate of the kind of patent, well, the base salt tilting. So like I said, I think in Angola, you do see that acceleration captured in the ramp incline basin. So everything's sped up when you get the uplift of the African continent. So it seems like there, there's a, there is an opportunity to couple that acceleration to some broader geodynamics. Yeah. I think as well, you can see bits of that in, well, you can't see it as readily in the Levant margin due to the, you know, the uplift of the uh, of Lebanon. Um, so I think you can couple it to regional geodynamics and uplift. If that, I, I, I'm trying to see his question here to make sure I, yeah. yes, I think that's how they play a role. I think you can couple the rates, which is part of the kinematics to the, um, the basin tilting. And the rotation you estimate assumed a rigid body rotation. Um, I think there's probably, yeah, it depends what you mean, this assumption. I mean, we seem to, if, if we're correct in restoring the ramp seek incline basin back to the largest step we see up dip, then it looks like the rotation has been um relatively rigid sean's yeah. work where we saw differences in the the kind of pulsing of her ramps incline basins we thought maybe was indicative of more diffuse shear but that was over the scale of maybe 150 kilometers long strike um so i'd say it's an observation and not an assumption per se but yeah i'm not sure if that answers one's question i'm just looking yeah um yeah perhaps uh Juan, if uh, you want to comment on that, if that, uh, that answered your question, uh, please let us know and uh, we can follow yeah. up. Um, so we'll just move on to the next question from Ross Taylor. Uh, really nice presentation. Could you please comment on the range of infill observed in one of one or two examples? That is where the where base is more likely to be filled by classic or carbonate. Um, and then the second part of the question, can you pull out some, can you pull out the position of gradients? To, to predict where you might expect deep water fence versus a gentle shoreline deltaic final forms or carbonate ramps. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the, the first bit of the question to do with the composition just depends on the broader geology and the setting where you find yourself. So in the Sao Paulo Plateau, you're fairly distal there. So you were in an area of relatively deep water post Albion, so relatively deep water clastics post Albion at least. Um, but there are turbidites, so Clara Rodriguez looked at some of those in her PhD. There's lots of sandy deposits, but they're relatively inboard and they're actually within very deep mini basins and not really within the ramp syncline basins in that case. If you're in a carbonate depositional environment, you could imagine similar things. You might just get carbonate bearing deep water deposits as opposed to clastic bearing deep water deposits. So I don't think it's got anything really to do with the ramp syncline basins. They'll just receive the sediment and that they are given. The other part of the question related to the gradient. So yeah, it, and Ross, tell me if this answers your question. One thing you could do is in the restoration, try and restore what the paleo seabed is like, but I don't know how you would do that without incredibly good well control. So you're probably looking at depositional gradients of a degree. So how would you how would you restore that back to, um, you know, how would you restore such subtle changes in degrees and say that this is an area that might capture deep water gravity flows? I think that might be slightly hard. I think within individual uh, depot centers. Just one second. Yeah, so that might be, um, that might be a, a little bit, um, a little bit difficult to, um, to do. Mm, yeah, okay. Um, so next one is from Lorenzo Di Lauro. Excellent, excellent talk, Chris. I'm wondering if there is any evidence of translation mini bases in the North Sea. That's a really nice <laughs> question. Uh, if so, <laughs> where they can be easily seen. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know if Ollie Duffy's on this call. I didn't see him in the participants. I haven't seen him. Uh, no, I don't see I've seen him, but this is his. <laughs> one. Um, yeah, so we're looking for them. And um, we have evidence of strongly tilting mini basins. I wouldn't want to say publicly that I've seen a ramp syncline basin in the in the in the in the North Sea yet. But it's got all yeah. the ingredients, right? Because it's got basalt relief related to the um 
pre-Permian rift. It's got base help relief related in some ways to the um, late Jurassic rift in places where very the salt movement was yeah. relatively but very late. Um, so yeah, we just haven't seen them yet, but absolutely. Uh, uh, Oli, uh, okay, just saw from Rochelle, uh, Oli is there in the audience. So if, if Oli <laughs> wants to comment on that, uh, Oli, you're free to comment. Uh, and hello, Oli. <laughs> sorry, we are looking for them. <laughs> sorry, I haven't seen it. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to comment. Um, yeah, I would expect to see some Remsican bases somewhere in the North Sea. So I'm really looking forward to see what you guys can, can pull out of that. And I would expect this to kind of. Uh, Correlate to what Maria and Piotr asked about the subsalt uh, faulting interacting with the translation, because then you have the Jurassic rifting, which is post uh, salt. So you might have the interplay between rifting and translation. Um, yeah. And that's something that I also think Maria, Maria Roma modeled on her physical model. So it'd be interesting to see this, uh, yeah. this correlation. Um, so, yeah, Oli, we are waiting for, for you to comment on this. Um, <laughs> Um, if there's any other questions while Ali finds the mute button, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so from Zoltan Anger, uh, nice and interesting presentation. Uh, this process may be cause this process may cause the HC reservoir leakage. Um, mm -hmm. Exclamation! Thanks a lot. Bye. Yeah, that's just a comment. Uh, from uh, the question from Ioannis Alexandridis. Um, Hi, happy new year. I wanted to ask. Happy New Year, Ioannis. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is the main reason for a salt anticline top normal fault to stop its activity? It stops when all the system stops the extension. Could, could we have a new depot center mini basin on top of a normal fault wind salt anticline, like a small rift system? Um, I'm not sure I follow the question precisely, but I, but if I understand it correctly, and Ioannis, if I don't get this right, please let me know, but <clears throat> I think I think if you're talking about the extensional faults I was talking about in the Santos examples, you know, where we get the ramp syncline basins forming, then we get stretching of them and we actually dissect them with normal faults. There are new depot centers forming at that point. So you do in some ways get small rift systems, quote unquote, around the edges of the ramp syncline basins. They, so in, in, in the Santos case, some of those are due to widening of the diapirs as well and a collapse of the overburden. So you get super salt graben or super diapir graben there as well. Yeah, I think the answer to the question, please. Yeah, that's uh, that spot on. Um, so the next question is from Adler Suarez. Adler is a very old friend of mine from Brazil, actually, my former colleague from the university. Hello, Adler. Thanks for joining us. So Adler says, thanks for the presentation, Professor. Really interesting subject. Can we say that there is a higher probability for reservoirs in the proximal ramp syncline basins compared to the more distal ones? That's a brilliant question. In some ways, no, because <laughs> if, if you imagine the, the lowermost depot center used to be much further landward, that could have been receiving sediments, even though now it's 30 kilometers down dip. Exactly. So, you can take that older deposited reservoir and move it down dip. You can have a new ramp syncline basin depth center forming, put some sand in there, move that down dip. So things were deposited in proximal settings, but subsequently transported seaward. Yeah. So yes, I think depending again on what the driver is for the sediment input, that could actually um, that actually could control whether there's coarse plastic sands in the ramp syncline basins. But I think that's one of the really cool things is you could actually have sand a lot further seaward than you might think you should have because everything started life much nearer towards the land. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that question highlights well the importance of translation of your super salt reservoirs, right? So yeah, it's a good yeah. question. Uh, the next one from Mazin Al-Salmani. Al Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, have you looked to the upper cramb up, sorry, upper precambrian salts and salt bases in Oman? If they will be similar to the examples you've presented, uh, because they are considered highly petroleum prolific basins. Yeah, so those are the that's the um, Ara salt, I think is the name, um, quite an old salt, and it's quite heterogeneous again, if I remember correctly. It's got lots of anhydrites and carbonates in there and um, partly encased mini basins, I think. There, I, 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 everything I've read about there is only ever documented mainly passive diaprism downbuilding. So lots of, you know, what would be referred to as vertical salt tectonics. So I'm not aware 
of there being a lot of horizontal translation that's been looked at. But it's like a lot of things with new data, new ideas, there could be things waiting to be found, yeah. Cool. Um, so the next one from Abouzede Abu Bakr. Uh, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it right. Sorry if I'm not. Um, uh, oh, just a second. So Mazin just commented, yep, that's the one, out of salt. Uh, so yeah, we're good. So Abouzede says, thanks, Chris, for your great talk. Uh, it's been very insightful. I was wondering what the scenario would be in a pool of our base in where, this, where there are strike sleep faults. Yeah, I guess you could have that as long as you've got base salt relief. And there, if you have transtension or transpression, you could get a little drop down or a drop, a push up, respectively. Yeah. Um, it, it, the kind of ramp inclined basins, I guess, are agnostic towards where the base salt relief comes from. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> no. Um, so that's why we see them in the Levant where we have um, base salt folds. And we see them in rifts where we have base salt faults. Yeah. I think, yeah, one of the things is also that there is a space for things to translate, right? There is a uh, space for thin skinned uh, tectonics. Right? If, the, if the base is too narrow, you might not have that uh, recorded translation. You may even have some translation, but it, it will be hard to observe. Um, yeah. With ramps and climb basin as well. Um, so the next one is from Mar Moragas. Hello, Mar. Uh, thanks for the talk, Chris. Maybe I missed this part. Have you recognized any trends in uh, ramp incline basin characteristics, size, rates of translation related to the di direction of the base salt relief, uh, landward versus seaward dipping ramps? That's the yeah. So thanks, Mar. That's um, exactly the 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 the, the kind of. Um, point of the last four slides in that last bit of red text is to try and start to compile data in a bit more of a systematic way um, to get a handle on whether there are any systematic variations in those interrelations between those parameters. So this was this talk was a good chance to actually for me to go back and actually look at some of the older work and, and try and pull that together. But that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think there's much more work to be done in terms of modeling these features that we recognized in the last couple of years. So I think, yeah, you, uh, Sean, me and the others, we are just kind of scratching the surface. I think there's much more to understand in terms of uh, steepness or length of the ramps. What is the control of the ramp? Is it normal faulting or is it just inherited relief? Uh, how things vary along strikes. So there is a lot of uh, ground for research, which is, which is yeah. cool, which is good. Um, uh, there is, so a comment from Mark is that there is locally very minor development of ramps and climb bases in the North Sea, uh, smiley face. The problem is that there is very little thin skin translation. Yeah. 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 It makes, it makes sense. I agree with you, Mark. Um, uh, Johan is the comments again. And another one, if I may, could we have a mirror image of ramps and climb bases in a rift setting? If yet, yes, how would, how would it look like? Um, Depends really, Anis, what you mean by rift setting. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess if you're in an active rift where the salt is sin rift or the salt is pre rift, you could definitely have that. And I think I thought some of uh, Maria Roma's beautiful physical models kind of got at this point, right? They yeah. showed this interaction between these salt detached ramps, incline basins, and thick skinned extension. Some of the work she did with, I think it was uh, Oriol was involved in that for there. So yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you could have that in a in a in a rift setting, and there it's going to be super complicated because it goes back to the point I think Maria and Peter were making earlier on about sub salt faults slipping as everything's moving horizontally. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, Maria, if you want to comment as well, or Oriol, I don't know if Oriol is present um, it's, it's in the talk. Um, actually, if um, so, there was a comment here from from Rochelle. So Oli is in the audience, he raised his hand. So Oli, if you want uh, to talk, you can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, and let us know. Um, Chris, just a question, like we are 10 past four. So if you have any, if you need to, can we still, no, we still have a... managed to stop the kids from smashing through the door so far, but like, <laughs> in my... well, have, we have just a few more questions. So, if, uh, okay. You okay? all right, cool. Um, so the next one is, um, okay, from Andrea Ramiro Pierin. Uh, great presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, Chris, could you share with us what pitfalls did you find during restorations? 
Oh, yeah. So uh, I don't know if Oreo Erdi's on the call, but some of the restorations, his paper's just been accepted. Um, so it'll be out soon. So there's a big supplementary material in there where we try to go through how we did the restoration, what the pitfalls were. It's really quite hard sometimes, even if with the ramp incline basins, when you're pulling the ramp incline basins up to the top of the ramp for the onlap position, how then you treat the um, salt structures. So how you move them is relatively straightforward horizontally, but then whether you deflate and stretch them or you know what they're doing themselves is actually quite hard. Um, so that I would say that's one of the significant pitfalls is it allows you to kind of move things around in a kind of crude sense, but then some of the details are quite hard to get up. But I really strongly encourage you to um, look at that paper when it comes out and the preprint is available. And thanks to Juan Soto who's on the call, who's one of the, who was one of the reviewers, because Juan, your comments really pushed us to work really hard on the supplementary material to try and get that restoration approach out in the community a bit more for people to pick out and improve on. Yes, uh, thanks, Chris. I just uh, replying to Ali here. So Ali actually uh, replied um, up there on, on Mark's comments. Uh, so he said, I would refer to Mark on this. We haven't systematically looked for ramps and basin, but it's something we look out for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just keeping up the, the interest in ramps and basin now in the North Sea, which is uh, good. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the next one, so just a few comments, excellent talk from Enrico Curcuruto. Great talks from Sam Haynes. Sam Haynes actually asked, how do you calculate the error for the rate estimate? What are oh, the yeah. key parameters, <laughs> particularly the horizontal yeah. component? So the, 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 the rate estimates are estimates and there are errors. And some of the chief errors are confidence with which you can pick the earliest or lowermost stratigraphically on that point within the ramp incline basin to bring it back to the what you believe is the causal step so there's two there's two issues there right one is being able to pick that on that point especially if it, the tail of the down depend of the ramp incline basin gets deformed by buckle folds and faults it's quite hard the other one is knowing which ramp that on that point formed due to yeah so that th th there's two errors there or two yeah errors uncertainties there and i would say another uncertainty is the age constraints without dates you don't get rates so if you don't have borehole data so like i tried to explain in the gulf of mexico example if you don't know the age of that earliest on lap point then it's kind of hard to get the rate so you might be able to get the rates for subsequent on lap points but not for the earliest one and that then impacts what you think the bulk translation rate is so i, I, I in my mind they're some of the biggest uncertainties on that point picking on that point earliest one age and then the causal ramp yeah yeah that's spot on yeah uh thanks please um so just a few more uh so one from renato fonseca is there a well-established relationship between this is a really good question between ramps and climb in geometry and the size magnitude of underlying highs or ramps Read Pichel et al. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, I just see that you, uh, you passed the ball to me now. But I mean, it's something that we try to do. But I, I think, as I said, I think there is more work to be done. And one one thing is to systematically analyze this in different basins, different settings. Um, yeah, I mean, what I would say, just to answer that question, and it's something me and you, Leo, talk quite a lot about. I don't think it's to do with the magnitude of base salt relief. I think it's yeah. the ratio between the base salt relief and the overlying salt thickness. So you can have yeah. a, you can have a quite as an extreme base salt high, but if you have quite a lot of salt that's flowing, that will buffer the effects at, at the top of the salt in terms of what the expression is of differential uplift and subsidence as, as the whole system is moving sideways. Yeah. Whereas if you have relatively modest or minor base salt relief, but very thin salt, then you may actually end up having quite well, relatively quite significant um, relief at the top of the seabed and therefore thickness changes in the ramp incline basin forming. Um, so yeah. I think it's the ratio is really critical. Yeah, in fact, I can comment on that as well a little bit. Is that, that, yeah, there is the ratio of thickness. There is also the, the heterogeneity of the salts as well. So you'd expect ramp incline basin and aloxone salts to actually flow slightly faster, perhaps because you are more halide rich salts. Uh, so not only the thickness, but also the, the heterogeneity, the composition of the salt layer may, be a, may play a role. Um, and I think what we talked a bit, little bit about is that you need a space. So sometimes you can have very steep ramps, but very narrow abrupt topography. You may not 
actually have a record of the ramp synclined base. You need the ramps, uh, you need the base or ramp that's relatively long. If you have a very steep ramp, depending where you are, you might not get a ramp synclined base, you might get extension because you translate really fast and you deform really fast. Um, I think, yeah, I think Leo, that's and for anybody on the call. And I think, I don't know how, I'm just trying to remember if Sean really got into that, but I think in Sean's case in Levant, that's certainly the case where you get these hybrid ramp syncline basins where yeah. salt thins so much above the crest of the subsoil anticlines that actually you couple the overburden to the underburden and you actually get extension because the system yeah. is pulling away down dip. So you yeah. effectively decapitate the ramp syncline basin with a, with a normal fault. And so I think, I know in Sean's paper and in her talk, she talked about this interplay between the pull of the system and the normal faults of dip, which are, which are accommodating the pull. Yeah, I think, I think some of the stuff from Francine as well showed that, that you have the ramp supply base in the Northeast, but in the South, you don't have that. You have a lot of extensional, yeah. uh, extension normal, uh, normal faults, least strict normal faults. Um, so there is this sort of interplay as well. So yeah, uh, Renato's question is really good. And I think it's something that we'd like to work a bit more. Uh, but I think it's something that we also need to analyze on a case by case basis, depending on, you know, each basin might, might, might be different. Um, so just some comments uh, from Ioannis. Thanks for your answers. Delightful presentation. Thanks. Uh, Josep and Tom, actually. Thanks, Josep, for, for commenting here. So he actually uh, comments on Maria's Roma work. It says, yes, there are ramps and climb bases transported up to 10 kilometers during sea rift in the barrier margins. Salt being pre reefed uh, there was one Maria model. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Josep Anton. Mohamed Abdel Fattah, what is the possibility to apply, another really good question, the ramps and climb basin idea in the Red Sea? Egypt just in initiated a campaign to explore in the Red Sea. Yeah, there's ramps and climb basins there. Um, yeah. Union salt, so similar age salt to what we see in the Levant Levantine margin as well. So I've not worked on that data yet. I know there's been a lot of new data collected there on both sides of the Red Sea. Um, so that's pretty cool. I'm just going to yeah. say, Leah, there's one other question here from Kate Giles about sedimentation rates. I just saw it. it's a very I, good point. Of, yeah. <laughs> and I took a slide out which actually had that in Kate in the interest of time. So yeah, sedimentation yeah. rate, the ratio between sedimentation rate and horizontal translation rate is really important. So when you have a high sedimentation rate relative to translation rate, the axial plane within the, which is determining, which is documenting the, the syncline um, epicenter axes is relatively steep. When you have a relatively low sedimentation rate, relatively translation rate, you actually have a very inclined, um, a gently dipping um, um, axial plane. So yeah, it, it completely, it is super, super, super important. Yeah, I was kind of trying to look for the figure here, but yeah, it's okay. I mean, you already answered the question. Yeah, uh, sedimentation rate is a definite factor on the Instagram basin geometry. And yeah, thanks Kate for the question. It was a really good point. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Um, I know I actually have a question on the chat. So from, let me just go back, uh, from Scott Kruger. How do you distinguish between translation over topography and lateral salt evacuation channel flow in your wrapped moving Roho example from the GOM? So I think from, yeah, from the example from Nayara. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the question to read it again. It's on the chat, Chris. Ooh, okay, then hold on. Ah, Scott, how do you seem to realize in 20 lateral evacuation? Oh, um, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question whether you're asking um, whether those wedges are due to differential evacuation simply from underneath that subsiding sediment mass or whether there's horizontal translation. I mean, I think in that case, the Nyara's work, this auxiliary bit of information is the fact that we know that the mini bases have translated sideways quite a considerable amount, independent of anything we've seen in the ramp syncline basins. But you're right, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, if you see those wedges, they could simply be due to differential salt evacuation from beneath the subsiding mini basin. It doesn't have to be a ramp syncline basin. I don't know if that answers your question, Scott. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, um, yeah, we can just, so there was the final comment. Yeah, Scott just said, yeah. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, 
I actually wanted to comment on the Red Sea thing. Um, yeah, so Mark actually said, Mohammed, there is an example published in Rowan 2014. So his paper on basin research. Um, I actually, I never really saw, but there is a presentation uh, at EG. I saw the abstracts that they try to use the ramp synchline basins, the Red Sea, to constrain base salt topography, base salt highs, or pre salt highs, actually. Yeah. Uh, if, if any of you who presented that is in the audience, please uh, drop me a message. I would be very interested to. To talk about that. Um, so there is a uh, work to be done with Red Sea, um, yeah, in the Red Sea Basin. We're really looking forward to see that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's it. Um, we can wrap up. I think, thank you so much, Chris, for answering the questions for this amazing presentation. I really, I really like it. I really enjoy it. I hope everyone did as well. Um, I don't know if any of the other uh, members want to say something. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone who hung out to hear all the rest of the questions. Yeah, sorry for running over in the question session. <laughs> um, ah, no, don't be sorry. We yeah. always run. I mean, that's our fault, actually. We, uh, we kind of uh, put you to the test with many questions. We put the speakers <laughs> <to>. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, one, just one comment from my side. So the presentation I'll make available so I can, I, I don't know, I can put it on big share and then you can circulate it to the attendees list or something. So I'm happy to share the talk. Good, yeah. If anybody's got any yeah. additional stuff they want to chat to us about, then I'll be happy to take that. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thank you. It was amazing, you. As, as usual. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, that we're going to have, um, actually, let me check. We have the next talk in two weeks. Um, if any of you can uh, remind yeah. me who, who's presenting it's, in um, two weeks. Jessica thompson Job from USGS. Right. She's presenting on Sinbad Valley uh, on the Colorado side of the Paradox Basin. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'll Good see to you in two you. weeks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Yeah.